Welcome to the Treasure of Glory podcast. My name is James, and I really appreciate you checking this out. Check out my website at treasureofglory.com. I've got some blog articles, and there's two free e-courses that are packed full of information, and you will be busy, trust me. You can also find me on YouTube. Just look for Treasure of Glory Ministries, and I've got videos on everything from string theory, quantum physics, the last days, the book of Revelation. I mean, just a lot of different stuff. So if you want to know more about what we're into, uh, go check out those websites. So we've been talking about politics and how the devil uses politics to help bring about his Antichrist agenda. It's called the Spirit of Antichrist. And you better believe the Spirit of Antichrist is in the political world, working through politicians. And people could be inadvertently influenced by the Spirit of Antichrist. That's the thing about it. It's deceptive. You don't believe in this stuff and know that you're being deceived. Who does that? Well, some people do. They're called liars. But some people have been sucked into the spirit of Antichrist mindset and don't even realize it. And sadly, many Christians have been sucked in. Because you've got to understand how the devil works. Everything Satan tries to push, he packages it as moral and righteous and justice, social justice. He loves to label things to make them look good. He likes to package them in just the right way so ignorant people go, oh, this is awesome. It takes a very wise person, someone who has renewed their mind in God's Word, to be able to see through the lies. So let me just explain how this works. Everything we see going on right now in our culture, the so-called culture wars, you know, we're right in the middle of an informational war, a culture war. It's actually a spiritual war. But let me show you how you get there. See, everything right now that's being pushed on our culture by the left is not about politics. Now, they think it is, and they say it is. Okay, but just follow me on this now. Everything that's being pushed right now by the left, transgenderism, critical theory, abortion, it's an attack on God's authority. Now, see, it's packaged as politics. But really what it is, it is a way to strip Christians of their authority and to attack the foundation of truth so people are confused and deceived. You see, the transgender movement doesn't have anything to do with rights. Satan is using these people to push sin. At the root of all of this is sin. Now, I know nobody wants to hear that, Nobody likes that term, but I don't care, because sin is sin. And if you're going to let the devil manipulate you, and then if the devil is going to use you to push his darkness, then I'm going to call you out on it. You're being manipulated politically. But what Satan's goal is, ultimately, is to remove God's authority from our culture. Satan would love nothing more than to push God totally out of society. And that's what he's doing. And he's about succeeded. And the church just sits back and lets it happen. Look, we know how it's going to go down. We know the beast is going to rise. We know the Antichrist is going to rise to power. We know the saints are going to be killed. The tri- we, we know all of that. But does that mean that we have to just roll over and die and just say, okay, well, we accept defeat? I just cannot accept that. So that's why I'm here. That's why I do this, because maybe one person will agree with me. That's all I need, just one person. Or actually, I, don't, I really don't even need anybody. I just do this because I feel led to. It's a way for me to express myself. Maybe it's therapy for me, and maybe nobody cares, but I care. And actually, I know there's people out there listening, because I can see the analytics, and I know what's going on. So All of you who do listen, I appreciate it. Some of you get it. Some of you understand exactly what I'm saying. Some of you are beginning to understand, and you're starting to look into these things, and that's why you keep coming back, because you see, yep, he knows what he's talking about here. And that's not because I'm special. It's because I've read the Bible. 
This information is available to anybody who wants to read the Bible. This stuff really is not hard to figure out if you just take the time to read and study God's Word. That would solve a lot of our problems if we would really do that. Instead of just talking about it, you know, instead of just reading a few verses here, a few verses there, if you actually really commit to it, you will understand. It's not hard. We've been given the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit teaches us. Right? But if you don't crack the book and you don't read it, you're not going to learn anything. But I just want you to know that the political realm is used by Satan to bring about his Antichrist agenda. This battle between the parties, this political battle, at the root of it all, it is a spiritual battle. Make no doubt about it. We are in the middle of a spiritual war. It's truth against lies. Christians, we have the truth. We have the truth. We have God's Word. And we need to speak that truth into our culture. Because there are a lot of ideas floating around right now in society. And we need to make sure that Christianity is one of those options. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about critical theory. This new idea that's floating around. And we're going to talk about it from a Christian perspective. But before we do, let me read to you from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. This is from the Apostle Paul. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See, you don't want to be a part of a political system that teaches hate and bitterness and victimhood. No, be a part of what Paul's talking about, abounding in thanksgiving. Walk in Christ rooted and built in Him and established in the faith, and then give thanksgiving. Don't walk around as a victim and mad at the world like everybody owes you something. No. Be a thankful person. Say, I may not have everything, but I'm thankful. I praise you, God, I'm alive. I thank you, God, that I'm breathing. I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal from, but I thank you that you've got it all taken care of. See, that's called faith. Being established in the faith. But if you're a part of a political system that reminds you every single day about how victimized you are and how nobody likes you and you've got to go out and riot and tear up everything, that's of the devil. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. That is not of the Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian doing all that stuff, you should know that. But going on here with Colossians, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Let me read that again. See to it that no one takes you captive. What does that mean? Make you a prisoner. Hmm. How are they going to make me a prisoner? Are they going to put me in chains? What does Paul say? By philosophy and empty deceit. Huh. So, Paul, you're saying that I can be a prisoner Because of philosophy and empty deceit? Yep. How am I a prisoner? You're a mental prisoner. You're believing lies, and you're acting out on those lies because you're thinking wrong. You are believing wrong ideas, bad philosophy, empty deceit, according to human tradition, Paul goes on to say, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So you see, the origin of some of these philosophies are the elemental spirits of the world, the spirit of Antichrist, Satan's kingdom. He's behind all of these deceptive philosophies, all of these things that sound good. They have nice slogans, Black Lives Matter. Ah, you better look deeper. Yeah, Black Lives Matter, you better believe Black Lives Matter. But what about the philosophy that this whole thing is built on? Can we look at that? Are we allowed to question that? No, no, no. Just focus on the slogan. See, and if you go against that, you're racist. Nope. Sorry, that's not going to work with me. See, here we think critically about things. You don't just get to make blanket statements like that. No, we think critically here. 
No, everything can be scrutinized, and that doesn't make it racist. And we want to know if some kind of philosophy or new political idea that's floating around is of the elemental spirits of the world, or it's in Christ. What spirit is behind it? And as Christians, we need to ask that question. No matter how good it looks from the outside, no matter what the slogan is, is the spirit behind it of God or not? See, Paul had to warn the Christians in Colossae to not get caught up in the philosophical trends of their time, because those trends contradicted the gospel of Christ. I think the same warning needs to be heeded today, because if we aren't careful, we can make the same mistake. Not that philosophy is bad, it's just that our philosophical reasoning should be rooted in Christian doctrine. We need to always remember that it's the gospel and God's word first, and then everything else is filtered through that. God's words should shape our philosophy rather than the other way around. So why does critical theory and all the social justice stuff going on in our culture matter to us as Christians? Well, first we need to know what people in our culture are embracing if we hope to reach them with the gospel. There are so many voices out there competing for the hearts and minds of the people, and unfortunately, Most of those voices come from the spirit of Antichrist. There are all kinds of ideas out there floating around in our culture. You've got political ideas. You've got philosophical ideas. There's all kinds of sociological ideas, religious ideas. It's all like a buffet out there. Just take your pick a little bit from here, a little bit from there. So we need to make sure as Christians the gospel message is one of the options on this buffet. But see, the problem we are facing as Christians is all of these competing worldviews have teamed up against Christianity because they want to take us off the buffet. See, we're the biggest threat. So we are censored, we're bullied, we're called racist, phobic, and all kinds of deplorable names. The biblical worldview to the woke crowd is the enemy of progress, and that's why it is being targeted by the woke mob. And all this political stuff you see going on, it's really an attack on God. Transgenderism, it's an attack on God's Word. He created them male and female. And that's exactly what they're attacking. But you're not allowed to speak against it, or you're transphobic. You see how this works? Do you see how the devil works? He's slick, I'm telling you. All of this stuff matters to us as Christians because... Like all Antichrist teachings, it eventually makes its way into the church. And that's the scary part. You expect the people of the world to get sucked in because they're ignorant, and they don't have spiritual discernment. But the people of God need to be sensitive to this stuff. Because, see, Satan likes to use theological language, and he likes to appeal to our moral selves. That's why all of this political stuff is packaged as moral. None of this is new. Because you read the New Testament, you see the writers rebuking false teachings that were contrary to the apostolic doctrine. Paul and John, for example, they had to deal with Gnosticism, which was a philosophical idea floating around at that time that contradicted the teachings of Christ and the apostles. The church has always had to be careful to not allow Antichrist teachings to slip in. And in our generation, it's really no different. This should not surprise us. See, we have to be on guard. We have to be careful, and we need to make sure that what we are embracing is of God. The Antichrist spirit is always trying to get a foot in the door, and it will use as many different ideas as possible to do it. And wokeness is the one we have to deal with in our generation. This is our Gnosticism that Paul and John had to deal with. See, here's the thing that bothers me about all this wokeism this wokeness. Christians were woke way before there was ever a word woke. Wanting racial equality and justice is Christian, not woke. We wanted this stuff way before any woke people came around. Loving everyone regardless of skin color does not make you woke. We've been doing that a long time. Christians have. Christians were doing all of this way before you ever had a woke movement. Looking at America's history and recognizing the sins of the past is not being woke. It's called intellectual honesty. 
And 30 years ago, I was taught all of that stuff. 30 years ago, we were teaching people in our schools that slavery was bad, that racism was bad. So I'm having a hard time understanding how there's systemic racism everywhere. Yes, there are racists in the world. Yes, we have problems. But I believe the solution is the gospel of Christ, not a social gospel that teaches hate and division. That's all I'm saying. I'm not denying that we have problems. I'm not denying that black people have a harder time than white people. I'm not denying that white people have a certain degree of privilege. But I don't believe that the answer to these problems is critical race theory and Marxism. And that doesn't make me a racist. So Christians have been woke since the beginning. Okay, but this is what liberals do. They like to define terms. Have you ever noticed how they try to define everything? And they make words and concepts mean whatever they can to help them spread a political narrative. And because they control the news media and they control Hollywood and the music industry and academia, basically, they get their ideas into the mass consciousness of the nation within a matter of hours. What they say spreads so quickly and then everybody buys into it. And if there's anything liberals can do well, it's this. Overcorrect. They overcorrect everything they touch. So this is what we see in critical theory. They want to correct the system in place and replace it with something even more oppressive. So what does wokeness actually mean? Here's what it means. It means being awake to inequity and injustices in society and embracing critical theory, with critical race theory being a subcategory. Critical theory encompasses many academic fields. Like you go to a university and you find gender studies and feminism studies and cultural studies, neo-Marxism and all these other things. That is critical theory. So this philosophy has its foothold in academia, and it's starting to spread. Now, wokeism also means looking at the structure of society along racial lines. Critical race theorists also claim that race is a social construct. It's not biology. It's a social construct. And here's the real scary part. White people are inherently racist. Yes, I said that correctly. The people who write books on critical theory say these things. That white people are inherently racist. That we built a civilization that is structured to be racist. Some people go as far as to call white people inherently evil, like we're a virus, and that we all grow up to be demons. This actually came out of someone's mouth. Now, in critical theory, they see society built into different strata, or levels of oppression. It's kind of like the food pyramid, with whites at the top experiencing the least amount, and blacks at the bottom receiving the most. And the higher you are on this pyramid the more you oppress those below you. Okay, but here's the thing. Everybody is in a race to the bottom of the pyramid. Everybody wants to be the biggest oppressed group because they have the most influence. They get to scream the most, and they get to destroy the most. They get the most press. But you know what? It's all fake because the most persecuted minority group in the world is Christians. But you don't see anything on the news about that, do you? So here's one thing you must know about this stuff, that it's all built on Marxism. It has its roots in Marxism. But with critical race theory, it goes way beyond just economics. See, Marxism was an economic theory or philosophy. But this has gone way past that. This is used as a prism to see every dimension of life. But like Marxism, some who champion this stuff have no problem with physical violence and revolution being a vehicle to bring about the change they want. This is why we see people in the streets tearing up stuff, because they feel like they are justified in this. It's called justice. Now, here's the thing about critical theory. It's not really a theory, per se. It's more of a meta-narrative or a worldview. Make no doubt about it. We all have a worldview, and not all worldviews are equal. Now, I know in our society we don't like to say that, but it's true. Not all cultures are the same. They're not all equal. A cannibalistic culture is not as good 
as a free society. I mean, come on. So make no mistake, a Christian worldview and the worldview that forms the foundation of critical theory do not mix. Like oil and water, they just aren't compatible. So trying to fit this stuff into the gospel will only pollute the pure gospel message. So one reason critical theory won't work with the gospel is its attack on the family structure. The Bible defines what a family is. The Bible gives us a blueprint for how we are to structure society, and the family is the basic ingredient. The Bible makes it clear that humans were created male and female, and they were to marry and have babies. God said, fill up the earth, be fruitful, multiply. So the biblical model was for a man and a woman to stay together until death and only be with each other with no other sexual partners. Critical theory sees this as racist. That's right, racist. Not biblical, racist. They see it as oppressive. It's an invention of white people, they say, to keep black people down. As if white people are the only ones who benefit from solid families. I mean, just look at the statistics coming from the black community. Decades ago, a shift took place in the black community where fathers were absent. When this happened, everything went downhill. The literacy rate dropped. Incarcerations went up. Drugs, crime, and all kinds of problems crept into the black community. And it's when the family structure of a mother and father raising kids became less and less. It was not a racist, oppressive society designed to destroy black people? Come on. It happened from within because biblical values were not lived out. And when that happens, the curse always shows up in some form. So what's happening with critical theory, instead of addressing the problem head on and at the spiritual root, we're going to shift the blame and blame white people. And say that we created a society that was built to benefit us And destroy others. Wow, this is some dangerous stuff. This is very, very divisive and dangerous, and I hope you can see where this is coming from. This is not the Holy Spirit. I mean, here's some problems with this. First off, this kind of thinking creates an environment where people look for racism under every bush. If you condition people and program people to see racism everywhere, then you are creating someone who's constantly going to be on edge, that's constantly going to be building walls between people. That person's never going to have good relationships with other races. They're constantly going to see racism. If your brain is trained and conditioned to think this way, it's only going to make you read racism into every facial expression, every mannerism, every word that someone says. Every encounter you have with someone of a different race will turn into a critical, highly defensive interaction where you won't allow love to operate. So you're going to push love down and allow the hate and hostility to rise up and dominate. That's not the Spirit of God. That's another spirit. So you're being controlled by another spirit. You're being controlled by your flesh. And the Bible says that we are not to walk in the flesh, but to walk in the Spirit. See, none of this promotes Christian unity and love. It conditions people to begin from a place of hatred and then try to force others to think like you rather than starting from a place of unity and peace. Another problem I see with this is it's an overcorrection. Like I said before, it doesn't really solve the problem of racist injustice or whatever form of justice they claim has been violated. It replaces the so-called oppressive system with an even more oppressive system and ends up doing the very thing it sought out to eliminate. Now, let me say this. If you are a racist in the true sense of the word, meaning you hate people of another race and think you are superior to other races, you will not like heaven at all. Now, I know the term racist keeps evolving, So it has become a malleable term to help Democrats push a political narrative, because if you slap the word racist onto something, well, you've just convinced half of the unthinking population of our country that it really is racist. You know, they're not going to think critically about it. But if we stick to the true meaning of racism, where you hate people of another race, 
and assuming you even make it to heaven with that type of hatred in your heart, there will be people from every race, every language, and every nation there. See Revelation 5, 9 through 10. So you know what? You're not going to fit in at all. Racism is wrong. The Bible is not racist, and it does not teach racism. If you read and study the Bible, you'll see a much different picture. You see God right away working out His plan of redemption to save all people of all races from their sin. He chose Abraham and his seed to be His covenant people, yes, but they were not chosen because God prefers Hebrew people over other people groups. He chose them because of Abraham's faithfulness, number one, but so God could use Israel as an instrument to manifest His glory to all the other nations. God was never to just be a tribal deity. He was and is the God of all the earth, and God sent Jesus to die for all mankind. That's the beauty of the gospel. It transcends race. It transcends gender and all of this surface-level stuff the people of the world can't seem to get past. This is why I've always said that the political activism will only change culture from the outside in, not the inside out. Only God's truth can do that as we spread the gospel. That is truly what transforms hearts and minds. Not this divisive, racist, critical theory that pits everyone against each other. That is clearly not from the Holy Spirit, but from an unholy spirit. So let me tell you what being woke really is. Woke is understanding who you are in Christ. Wokeness is having a proper identity in Christ, not in some political group or race. We don't have a racial crisis in this country, quite as much as we have an identity crisis. People don't know who they really are, or could be in Christ. Their identity is all wrapped up in their race or community, things that are fleeting and transitory and have no eternal value. But as children of God, our identity is in Christ. So what are we in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, when you're in Christ, you are alive to God, Romans 6.11. When you're in Christ, you are made holy, 1 Corinthians 1.2. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.21. We are sons of God in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.26. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17. This new creation life transcends race, gender, politics, all of the shallow things of the world. We must address social issues and political issues not by dividing and creating more oppression, but setting people free in Christ. So we don't preach a social justice gospel. We preach the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus to atone for sins. And unlike the sins of the social gospel, the sin in Christianity runs deep, more than skin deep, in fact. Racism is sin, no doubt about it, but it's not the only sin. And Jesus died for all of it. That's the message America needs right now. Not a divisive social justice Marxist racist doctrine that is clearly from the spirit of Antichrist. So we have a challenge before us in our generation. We have to defend the gospel and the glory of Christ. The world will hate us for it and we will be met with a lot of resistance. But don't back down. Don't be afraid to speak up. But above all, seek God and get in His word. Deepen your prayer life and press in because we are heading for tough times and we need to be ready spiritually. So I'll see you in the next episode and God bless.